Okay, welcome everybody. This is day two of our Juneteenth celebration. Um, day one. Well, we just had the party on the cookout on Sunday. Oh yeah, I knew that. So this is a <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm Shelly, ADO West, Dallas. I do apologize for interjecting. <laughs> That's because you wasn't there, nobody don't mean we didn't have a day one. <laughs> this, um, is why, this is why I thought we should have did the two hour one so we could bring all the drama, but I understand time is. <laughs> Can we get right? We just started. <laughs> hey. so, all right, anyways, I'm Trish with ADOS Atlanta, and um, it's myself, Nobly, and Shelly. Tomorrow we'll be bringing on. Um, it's not, not Marco Polo, Franco Summer Hour, who's our resident teacher with ADOS Atlanta, and he'll be um, day two of our presentation. So today we are doing Juneteenth um, celebration, but we are explaining our, why we need a designation for ourselves apart from everyone else, why it's important, and how we got to be African American, Black American, or whatever we want to call us right now, and why that's not sufficient. So, um, nobly, take it away. Okay, so I'll start off. Thanks so much, Trish, for that wonderful introduction. So, I'm going to go through what to expect in this presentation. Just so you know, there's going to be a lot of information. So if you want to take notes, that would be awesome. So first, we will take a journey through the ADOS census timeline. Then we will discuss the 2020 census and the new changes. Afterwards, we will briefly discuss the various labels used to identify ADOS from Negro to colored to Black to African American. Then we will explore the federal definition of ethnicity. We will then look at redefining our ethnicity to be more inclusive of ADOS and break down the ADOS ethnicity. Lastly, we will discuss the importance in completing the census form and the implications of not having or having a specific ethnic designation on the census. So I'm gonna run through the timelines kind of quick but not too quick where you won't be able to capture the details. So from 1790 to 1840, we were labeled as slaves on the census. Our ancestors were undocumented. As there was no notation of slave by name, age, sex, or, or origination appears. The census lists slaves statistically under the owner's name. From 1790 to 1950, the census takers determined the race of the Americans they counted, sometimes taking into account how individuals were perceived in their community or using rules based on their share of Black blood. It's pretty interesting. <clears throat> so this one is important. Um, to say that they were undocumented means that we were the first undocumented people on this land mass. Um, so for me, that just is just another example of erasure, like another um, segment of society taking our name, taking our fight, taking our um, <laughs> bottom castness onto themselves when they're not bottom cast and then propelling themselves forward and above us and leaving us right where we are. Yeah. And again, being undocumented um, meant that we were, on, we were documented, but only for the benefit of white people. We were undocumented as humans, but not undocumented as individuals. Yeah. Me, how they reduced our ancestors or to a, a slave 
and without accounting for name, age, sex, or anything like that. It's just very devastating information to find out. So, Yeah, so no name, no classification. So when you say chattel, that's it. That's mm-hmm. show, like cow, horse. Like that's how they <laughs> really viewed us. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I'll go on to the next slide. Between 1850 and 1860, we were labeled as slaves and non-white free persons on the census. For these two censuses, slaves were enumerated on a separate schedule. The names of slaves went undocumented. Census takers were instructed to substitute numbers in place of names on slave schedules. Free Black Americans in the 1850 and 1860 censuses were grouped with other non-white free persons. Okay. On the census in the 18 from 1870 to 1930, we were labeled black. As the first census after the Civil War, the 1870 census is the first to include formerly enslaved persons by name, along with the rest of the population. Most of the 1890 population census were destroyed by a fire in the Commerce Department building in 19, excuse me, in January, 1921. It's known as the missing census, which is very interesting. Yeah, I I think earlier when we were talking, I think it was Trish that noted that when she was searching out her family, she wasn't able to find any information from the 1890 census. Right, Trish? Oh, yeah, Yeah, it, it skipped. I got to 1880. And then 1910. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's it, so, I mean, the, the name, the missing sen- census, is very befitting. You know, it, it for many for many of us, majority of us, it is missing, and and that's very unfortunate. It is. Okay. It's going right along. So from 1940s to 1990, we were labeled Black and Negro on the census. The 1970 census was first to take place after the Civil Rights Movement ushered in the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. They welcomed a significant number of immigrants than previously allowed. This category was no longer specific to descendants of U.S. slavery. The 1970 census was the first time Americans were allowed to fill out their own forms and select a race category for themselves. So this is like a move on up, or at least they thought. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, like you would think that, uh, we talked about this where we were saying that our people would be happy about this because now, you know, you have another selection and you can write stuff in, but were we really filling it out? Cause I, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of distress, a lot of distress mm-hmm. um, with the government and why they want our information, you know, because up until that point, I mean, really up until that point and beyond, it was, collect the information to benefit white society. Right. Correct. It benefits everyone but us. So yeah. we're not feeling it out. I feel like we are more than 14% of the population. I've always said that, but I believe we, that too. we've not been counted properly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On purpose. Mm-hmm. And because we're leery of government. And so we're not trying to do this whole census thing. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see. And shout out to Nobly for a beautiful presentation. She did a, an amazing job. She really did. Well, Thank teamwork you, makes the dream work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it was the research. The research was key because without the research, we wouldn't have had anything to bring all of this together. You know, and we checked over information. We criticized each other when we had questions about the data to make sure because some of the stuff was just shocking you know so I think we all did a good job just making sure that we held each other accountable for our sourcing our sourcing of data and um 
you know, just bringing, making sure that the information um, has something to do with the overall mission of this project. Right. Narrowing it down was not easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> we would have had you guys here for two hours, two or three hours with the amount of information we had originally, but you know, we narrowed it down, chopped it down um, to make it more of a conversation to make sure that you guys were able to take away from it the necessary data. And I was concerned about it being too long, and now I'm like, let's put it all in. <laughs> Tell it all. <laughs> let's Tell it all. Let's just throw it all in there. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so okay. from... 2000 to 2010, we were labeled Black, Negro, and African American on the census. The 2000 census was the first time African American appeared and respondents were allowed to pick more than one race for the first time. The, um, the 2010 census was the first time Negro appeared. I was about to say something sarcastic right there, but I'm going to keep it to myself. What's the last <laughs> time? The last time it appeared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last time it appeared. And I saw in chat that people were, someone said that um, if we'd have kept it Negro, um, immigrants wouldn't like that. Like, we would have been separate right there because they would not have come in as that. They weren't going to do it. And I was like, oh, good point. So, uh -huh. mm-hmm. No so one wants to do the nigga, but everyone wants to use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody wants the benefits of the nigga, but don't want to be the nigga. That's right. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. On the 2020 census, we were labeled, we are labeled as Black and African American. This is the first census not to include Negro since 1940. For the first time, the Bureau has added a new space on the census questionnaire for Black and African American and white participants to write in their non-Hispanic origins. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and just real quick, um, it's really amazing that we're just one census away from being Negro, you know? Like, mm -hmm. we're just literally one census away from being Negroes. And so that means that everyone that is 11 and older, we're Negroes. You know what I'm saying? Um, every, every one of us mm -hmm. that is 11 and up. You know, 10 and under are experiencing, without even really understanding what they're experiencing, that they're no longer classified as Negro. Uh-huh. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, we're, we've moved along. Yeah, this is one of my favorite slides. I mean, there's a couple of, of my slides that are favorite. <clears throat> but I think this, uh, what this does is kind of builds credibility with some of the things that we've been saying. So these are just three of many reactions to the 2020 census changes. So... <clears throat> Here you have this individual, um, their name is Nayat Amar. And this person says that I'm African, I identify as black, but I don't see myself as an African American, says Amar, who was born in Ethiopia and now lives in New York City. We can't, excuse me, we, we can't just be black as African Americans. We are black from Africa. We are black from the Caribbean. We're black from everywhere. And that person is a legal advocate for immigrants in NYC. Not everybody, but immigrants. That's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So moving on to Ms. Lug, the director of advocacy for people living with HIV that identifies as black British. She says, this is a great step forward in terms of being able to get more specific information on who's actually living here. A more detailed census data about Black people's ancestry could improve the public health work at 
her organization, which offers free health screenings to immigrants. Not everybody, but to immigrants. <clears throat> yeah, so, very specific immigrants, too. Right. What about us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, specificity is very key. Mm -hmm. What about what I what about our ADOS HIV community? Mm -hmm. Which they has to be which has to be higher than a black British. How how many? Like I said before, it's two people. She's she's advocating for two people no, in the United States. No, that's not true. It's higher than two. It's probably nine. Or two two groups. Nine. You know two <laughs> groups. You know or, or two very specific groups: immigrants and HIV and 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 British immigrants. Black British black. British yes HIV. Immigrants. Yep. Jeez. But let's get to the JB squad, which we all belong to. Okay. So JB Ms. squad up. Oh? I'm sorry. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Greer says that she's 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 a JB honey, <laughs> which is just black. She says when people ask you where you're from, and I say, oh, you know, New York, Philly, Chicago, Baltimore, it's like, no, where are you from from? Noting that she's planning to write down Black American for her origins. <clears throat> yeah, yeah Miss Greer. Many, yeah, how many ADOs have that experience where we're asked where we're from from, you know? And people may not realize it, but they're offending us in the sense that they're dismissing our American heritage by asking us where we're from from when we are when we are already telling them. We're from America, you know, we're from Baltimore, we're from Louisiana, you know, but that's not good enough. We have to have roots somewhere else for our blackness to be valued. Yeah, so they can tell us we're lost and, and pat us on the head and feel sorry for us. And, oh, you don't know where you're from. Shut up from yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, I think it's that, of course, something like that is very common for people on those, in those states like your New York cities, your Jersey, uh, <laughs> California, Florida, and things like that. PA, rise like, up! PA, rise up! <laughs> I'm from Pennsylvania! Oh, PA, rise up! <laughs> yes, honey. Yes. Just blacks from Pennsylvania. Because mm -hmm. like, yeah. if you think about like, in, in Louisiana, you don't get asked questions like that. It's like when someone asks you where you from, they asking you what hood you from. You from Lakeside? <laughs> you from mm -hmm. Cedar Grove? Where you where from? your people from, or who your people? Mm -hmm. You know, like we. That's how we talk to each other. Ados from Ados. Like we understand, like where your people from, or who your people. But mm -hmm. when we're asked from um, by other people where you from from, it's one outside of America. Where are you from? Jamaica, Haiti, Ethiopia, Britain, you know, Brazil, Mexico, Dominican Republic. Where are you from? But to be, you know, an American black, it's it's not good enough. You know, and I know Trish, you are not Trish, but Shelly, you were sharing that um your experience um on the Eastern Seaboard a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> where you were yeah. saying that kind of like you know what I'm saying so I, I would love for you to hear I would love for you to share that with um the people your experience of living on the eastern seaboard as a black person or yeah. just a, a JB yeah so it was very rare for me to meet other ADOS people and and I was there like almost seven years and it was very very rare and what I also want to add is that people always was trying to throw you to some other place. Cause like at that time I used to wear my hair different. So I used to wear my hair straight and long or, and people, it didn't matter what race they were. People would always try to throw me to some Island or some country or something like that. And I'm like, no, I'm from here. And so, and people never, in most of, in most of my experiences, they never wanted to, um, they never wanted to uh, accept it. And so I've even heard one of my um, ADOS, uh, an ADOS good friend of mine that lives there, that, and she's been there longer than I have, that when she was growing up there, growing that, up there. and I'm sorry, when she was growing up in New York City, 
certain individuals from certain groups that would tell her to lie about her lineage, that would tell her to, to tell people that she's not ADOS. Like she had those experiences. And so, but she was, that's when she was a lot younger when she was experiencing it. But yeah, I feel like it's a strong possibility that a lot of Adolf people in those areas, they probably feel very alienated um, in some, in some situations. So yeah, that was, yeah. that was definitely my experience. And, and that's where I, I feel like it's, you're a foreigner in your own country, or at least you're experiencing being a foreigner in your own country. Um, because it's like you're, you feel like you're amongst your people per se, or, you know, your culture per se, but you realize that you're not amongst your necessarily, uh, necessary tribe when, when you're, you're being asked, okay, where are you from? You know what I'm saying? Um, where are you from from? Because if it's from your nest, if it's from means to be from Louisiana, what it means to be from Baltimore or, you know, Alabama. We understand what it means to be from America. But when we're having to sort of be shamed out of our Americanness, you know, um, it, it lets us know that we are the foreigners. Yeah. Uh, even when, though in, in our own country that we built. When everybody else is running here and are they asking Caribbeans the same thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for my experience being from Florida, well, I don't even know if it has anything to do with me being from Florida, but I've been asked a lot, um, or, or been told a lot, you look like the island black, you know? And I mean, I don't know necessarily what that means, especially once I got dreads. Um, you know, I, it would be like, you look like a, a, a island black. And I'm like, well, Florida is as close as you can get to a American island, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> So I don't know, I don't know necessarily if it's because I'm from Florida, but it was just like where people would just sort of want me to lean towards or accept, like, you know what I'm saying? To disconnect from being from America and just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm one of those, I'm one of those different blacks. I'm a different black. I'm not like one of those, you know, American blacks that y'all don't like. I'm one mm -hmm. of those different ones, but you know, if you're a person that has pride in your heritage, as we do, you don't feel the need to connect or to disconnect from being American, you know? Yeah. So when you hear where you're from, from, it's like where you lean even more into, I'm American, I'm from here. I'm, I'm yeah. an American Black. And what that, what that kind of boils down to is being from the JB squad, you, you know, where you kind of just equate, like, I'm just Black. I'm just, what do you mean? Yeah. And I think, and the last thing I, um, I'll say about this is that it gives an opportunity to have what I call a teachable moment. Whether you feel that you need to check somebody, correct someone, because what ADOS does is kind of restores that pride that we have. People try to go and, and, and they go and say that instead of feeling like, oh, somebody's trying to make you feel some type of way, that's that moment for you to just stand up tall in who you are to say, no, I'm ADOS and I'm proud to, I'm proud to be from this country. I'm proud mm -hmm. to say that my, my family built this, my ancestors built this country and yep. where you benefit from that. And I've started telling people that, and some people feel, you know, maybe it can come off a little arrogant, but I don't mean anything. Who I don't cares? mean, any harm, I don't mean any harm by it. It's, it's the truth. And so yeah. more, more people need to, need to, to kind of, to be that way when you get in, when you get in those situations, instead of feeling like, oh, this person is making, trying to make me feel, no, you stand up tall in, in who you are and, and where you come from. And, and that's just it. Because when you take the, take a moment, you ain't got to take a long time to kind of educate people, then they're like, oh, then their respect level is different. I don't have to feel like, I don't have to have this, what do you call it? Or feel some type of disconnect because I'm not born on the continent. Like there is no disconnection there at all. Like there is. Yeah. But well, that it's doesn't not even take... from being from the continent. It's being of any black heritage that's not American. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's value. Mm -hmm. 
if you are a Jamaican black, if you're a Dominican black, or it doesn't matter, a Haitian black, your black is considered to be of more value to the diaspora than an American black. We're ashamed out of our American heritage. And that's why, like, um, with Ms. Greer, you know, it, it it connects, it's relatable, you know, as an ABOS, because we understand exactly where she's coming from, where you're just having to explain yourself by just saying, you know, I'm just simply black. Because okay. we've been, we've been told like black is black and black is the same. But where you have, um, you know, our Ethiopian sister, and we have our black British sister, black, black isn't all the same. I am a black British and I am a black Ethiopian. And then where we have to kind of be comfortable, you know, just like the rest of the diaspora and accepting that, okay, we are black American and be okay with that. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right. So that brings us to talking about how did we get from Negro to colored to black to African American? And a little bit of spotlight will be put on the NAACP and Jesse Jackson um, because, you know, they played a, a huge role in reshaping our, our forced labeling. I won't even say our identity. And how is, how is the ABOS label different from the others? And how does the census play into this entire discussion? From Negro to Colored, to black to African American. Negro, derived from the Latin word nigger, the Spanish and Portuguese used the term to refer to, used the Negro term to refer to the people they enslaved from the African continent. Later on, other European enslavers, as the English, adopted the term for the same purpose. Negro was widely used and not just a thing of um, Europeans placing it on us, it was a thing where we accepted it as our identity as well. When you look at a lot of Martin Luther King's speeches, he referred to us as Negro. Um, Malcolm X, you know, it, it's throughout our history where you'll see that it was, it was just widely accepted as an identifying label um, for, for us. Um, but that was up until the Black Pride Movement of the 60s. And what the Black, Black Pride Movement did was it was about us um, accepting the term Black to replace the term Negro. And Black symbolized pride, power, and revolution. But no surprise, the NAACP Executive Director, Roy Wilkins, considered the term to be anti-white and he considered terms, he embraced terms, and the entire NAACP embraced terms as colored, colored, and persons of color, which were seen to be more accepted by white America and deemed to be less threatening than black, because black was associated with being military. So people as Roy Wilkins and Jesse Jackson felt the need to combat the black power movement um, because it was us being disruptive blacks. You know, black was being disruptive. So they brought in the term African-American to placate to white supremacy in a sense. And these are words, these are the exact words from Jesse Jackson, um, where he said to be called the African-American has cultural integrity. It puts us in our proper historical context. Every ethnic group in, in this country has a reference to some land base, some historical cultural base. African Americans ha have hit the level of cultural maturity. There are um, Armenian Americans and Jewish Americans and Arab Americans and Italian Americans. And with the degree of accepted and reasonable pride, they connect their heritage to their mother country and where they words. He was telling us to be a black American is to lack cultural integrity. To be a black American was to lack or is to lack cultural, is to be culturally immature, you know, and 
there were some very prominent voices that were in opposition of the African American label as Philip T. Gay. And what he argued was that the descendants of Africans brought to the United States have long since created a unique, a unique culture that overwhelmingly majority of black Americans are at least six or seven generations culturally removed from Africa. And what we ADOS have grown to understand, the African American label provides only artificial, sen uh, artificial sense of homeland land and nationality for Africa is not a nation, repeat, Africa is not a nation, but a huge heterogeneous continent, <laughs> which includes 54 countries. And he's comparing a continent with that of people that are, that are associated themselves with a culture of a nationality. And that's problematic. It's very problematic. He's calling us immature, like, like he's treating us like children. He's telling us, well, this is what we're going to do. And, and he's telling us we don't have any culture when I call America Europe light without us because that's what it would have been flavorless. It would have been raisins in the potato salad. Like it's just without us, there's, this is just Europe light because they sent their dregs. So we gave you gospel, we gave you country, we gave you soul, rock and roll, like. Honey, just, just say everything. Okay. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> like, like, like we gave you computers, we gave you Wi Fi, like that's us. We gave Trish, you I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, I can hear you. Oh, okay. We gave you the man on the moon, like, <laughs> I'm serious. Without us, they wouldn't be where they are. We gave you everything. And you've given us nothing but heartache, mayhem, madness, and murder. She says she um, can't hear me. I think it's something wrong with her, um, possibly with her um, volume or something. Connection. Um, yeah, because I can hear you all. Okay. Maybe it'll just take her a minute to get it. Um, what I was going to say was that... <laughs> I am so tired. Yeah. Yeah. We can. I am so tired of hearing the whole thing of we being lost and we needing to attach ourselves to some African culture when like what is an African culture? Like which one which one are you talking about? Um, and people like negate the fact that there has been suffering everywhere. And what I mean by that, by that is this, is that everybody else has created their culture and their communities out of suffering. And so for people to go and say that our, our lineage is not an actual, um, it's not an actual thing or that we don't have actual culture because it comes from slavery and things of that, that nature is actually bullshit. So it's kind of like everybody has, and, and I'm not, and when I'm, and when I say everyone has suffered, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that to say like, oh, all suffering is the same or something like that. I'm not saying it or implying that in anything. I'm saying that everybody uses whatever um, that they have accomplished or whatever has happened in their group, whatever, whatever land that they are on, they've used it to cultivate their own thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just think it's just, I'm just so tired of people repeating that. Even if you, even people that are, that are ADOS that are not a part of the movement who may not know yet, who don't understand that, that, that may not have a, a certain level of knowledge that repeat those certain things. And I remember, I'll tell you this one little story. I met a girl when I used to drive for Uber and she was married to a non ADOS person. And she was telling me this, this stuff about how 
she was lifting up this nun ADOS person and their group and how fantastic they are and how she mostly only deals with people in this particular group and things of that nature. And I literally had to, because <laughs> I feel like I'm always, I literally had to teach her in the, in that very moment to tell her, don't ever say that like in your life, like don't ever lift some other community up and put your own down and you should stop repeating those things. And so what happens is that you have these people that don't know or that don't have the knowledge and they'll get with other groups and they'll start repeating that same stuff. So I'm not having it. So, yeah. So Nobly is back. Can you hear us? now hello yeah hello can you hear hey. us yes i can hear okay we'll just wait for her to, to um get back in so um i put in the chat um oh i was putting in the chat what did i put in the chat oh <laughs> i was gonna put in the chat the link for the article the la times article for philip T Gray, Philip T Gay article from LA Times. So this was back in 1998, 1989. What did I say? 1998, 1989. And he said that African American, no bueno. Like, he, it, it was a commentary, a vote against use of african American, so people were against it people were speaking out like my kids even born after that time won't call themselves african-american they're like no i'm black <laughs> yeah like, and and no disrespect and no disrespect to, to africa or the african diaspora it's just again like our ethiopian sister and our british black sister said it's just we're black we're not just black you know um a bl black isn't flat we are black from somewhere i don't and feel we're the need black to say Americans. no disrespect because it's just if i'm proud of where and i don't i'm not disrespecting you by loving who i am and where i'm exactly. from just like they aren't so why do why do I feel the need to have to say, well, no disrespect, man, mm -hmm. man, please don't make me cuss, Lord, I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm trying yeah. to be disrespectful. Maybe I'm trying yeah. to be disrespectful sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and my point and my point and my point mm -hmm. is just simply that it's about us, not about anyone else. Not right. that it's about correcting you know what I'm saying? Not yeah, about gotta... uh, political correctness, but just it's about us. It's about yeah us accepting who we are and having pride in who and we are. Being proud you know what I'm saying? Be, be, be proud of, of having had our ancestors built where everybody wants to come. Yep. Yep. Well, the, the last thing I'll say about this particular slide is that if you think about it in history, everybody has a name. Everybody had a name of what they called themselves. That's how we know about them. That's how we know what they did and things of that nature. We have this Pan-African approach of saying like, oh, we need to all call ourselves Africans. This, no, that doesn't even make any sense to me. And it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm neglecting or, re or, or ne rejecting uh african people it doesn't mean that i have a right to identify however i choose to and nobody can try to coax me into that or try to say oh i you know oh you were or, or when people say like oh you were african before you're something else i'm like well people just if they focus more on what they need to focus on instead of trying to bully people into oh you got to say this and, and this is the way like that's something personal to you like that's something that you may be dealing with in your own in your own self and your own soul uh, of, or whatever but you can't force us to if people don't want to identify as african or african-american or, or or whatever nobody can no one can can fault them for it or anything so yeah and i think about also 
if you if we were all calling ourselves the same things, how would our how would though how would our kids and and great great grandkids and things and their kids how would they know who we were? How would they know who was here if we were all calling ourselves the same thing or all mixed up together? So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next. Nobly, you're muted. Nope, I'm fine. I'm sorry about that. I was talking on okay. mute. Um, so that brings us to the that brings us to the question of what is ethnicity? And not the not the overall term of what is ethnicity, but what is how do america define ethnicity how do the government define it because that's what matters you know not webster um but we're talking in in legality terms and america defines ethnicity on <coughs> excuse me america defines ethnicity as whether a person is of hispanic latino origin or not so pretty much if hispanic is the only is the only ethnicity that is recognized by the federal government. And to be Hispanic means to originate or descend from Spain or a Spanish speaking country. And it, that includes Latin America. And to be Latina or Latina are persons of Latin, Latin American origin or descent. And this definition is very exclusive to where <clears throat> It does not include not just ADOS, but no one but Hispanics and Latinos. And they erased everybody. Exactly, exactly. And does it must be redefined to be exclusive of other ethnicities. Because this definition again is only is only Hispanics. Um, if you aren't Hispanic, you don't have a right to have an ethnicity in America. Okay. And, and they talk about going to be a problem. No, what are you saying, Shelly? I said they know that this was going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, Other definitely. People were going to find a problem with it. If not immediately, people were going to start having an issue with it to be like, what about us? <laughs> Do you yeah. know how many ethnic backgrounds are here? Yeah, exactly. And to be able to discuss ethnicity, we have to understand that race is an invention. Um, because though we are classified as a race, you know, we aren't classified as an ethnicity. And the, the invention of race has to be understood as being a political and social construct created as a classification of people with the purpose of giving power to white people and to legitimize the dominance of white people over non-white people. Though we are defining race as bi bio biology for the purpose of this discussion, the invention of race was not founded on accurate biological or scientific truth. Race was invented as a legitimizing agent for justi justifying slavery and racism. When our ancestors arrived on the shores of what is now America, this racial caste was created to classify them as a permanent underclass. This system went as far as to count us as three-fifths a person since we were considered to be property meant to benefit white people. Okay. And this? This? Next. You want to say something, Trish? No, I was going to say next. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wanted to just make one point about it. It's just, it's so crazy that you would think that people would say, okay, let me, let's just do this for a while and let's just get rich. And then once these people, once these people get free, then everything could just be, then we'll just let everything be equal then. No, they didn't want to do that. <laughs> they wanted every generation to. And that has to be some of the most inhumane, greediest, mess I've ever seen. That is yeah. crazy. And yeah. the interesting and the interesting thing about it is that this doesn't just exist here. You have individuals that are coming from places who have these have similar um 
similar or some type of caste system and then they come here and then and then try to go and and and, and be and, and be for the and 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 stand in line with the caste system that's here you see what i'm saying like for instance if you take like in the the indian people and how they have their caste system there that's still that stuff is still existing and then they come here and then they're a person of color and then it's like okay it's if like they don't have a caste system back in their country like it's not deeply embedded in them so yeah, yeah. and that's why i was noting that we are hurt and disappointed in our diaspora brothers and sisters who are joining into or participating in our oppression knowing that this system was deliberately designed to have us as a permanent underclass mm -hmm. you know to where it does well i won't say that it read off because y'all corrected me on that but people interpret it as hatred where it's not hatred it's just we're angry we're upset that our diaspora and brother and sisters are aiding in our oppression knowing that this system was deliberately designed to target american descendants of slavery i you definitely know, think I, I definitely think most of them don't really understand and know that but i'm definitely not giving anybody a pass i can tell you that yeah yeah it's just unfortunate because we know oh, they we, know uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you it's can just unfortunate. see. Do you think that you would go to another country and see how the country is treating a certain group of people and not see it? Do you think that? Do you think that? Yeah, I think I think they see it. I don't think they understand. I'm not. I can't speak mm -mm. for all other people. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yep, mm -mm. it's kind of like it's kind of mm -mm. like the lady that was on CNN that said that her parents had indoctrinated into her and to not associate it with us. So a lot of this is like where um, our oh. diaspora and brother and sisters know, but a lot of them have just inherited the anti-American blackness from okay, but, other generations. Okay, but their parents know, they know too. They know. Yeah, they know. and I think that's where our hurt and our anger comes from is that that when we see people amongst us participating in our deliberate oppression you know what i'm saying it, it's like where we can't be okay with that because if you're not for our liberation you're by design for our oppression mm -hmm. that is a fact you know and again this is what makes america the perfect system of genocide against us is because for every ounce of liberation that we that we're able to get there's five ounces of oppression that they have pre-designed to have us not prosper you know what i'm saying because it, the system is literally meant and designed for us to be the floor america's floor that everyone stands on and i also think that just my opinion that I don't feel that a lot of other communities are, I would say in the, the black diaspora, I don't believe that a lot of communities are raised to really focus on the collective. That's just my personal opinion. I, I don't believe that. So you will have it where we have been known for centuries to be advocating for the collective fighting for the collective not even just the collective of here even the even the collective outside of the outside of the united states and so as far as i know i don't know anyone else that that has done that so correct me yeah. if i'm wrong but but yeah so if you come from a community where it's kind of like focus on yourself don't be concerned about nobody but yourself go after opportunity and things of that nature it's like okay i can understand to one degree where the disconnect comes but the thing about it is that because of what we stand to like how the suffering is for our community 
I cannot give a pass. Like I don't give. I'm I'm not giving a pass to that at all. It's like okay, you yeah. don't have to. They come here knowing. They vet these people. I'm telling you, the yeah. Senegalese man that I I was dating. And it's. It, it I, is, say, I just want to be clear that it's not just. It's not just the diaspora. It's it's everyone that comes to America, migrate to America, and pile on to our oppression. That is problematic. Well, they know. And they know yeah. their what role. Think, what and that's why it's key to understand that it's, it's a legitimizing agent to our oppression. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that, I just think that more of them just need to be checked on, their, on, on the BS, just like that lady that showed up the other day um, yelling over there in D.C. acting like a fool. And so she was saying all of those things. I was like, oh, those people are being too nice. Oh, yes, that was on Twitter. I don't, in case you guys, um, the audience doesn't doesn't know what we're talking about. It was this, um, I don't know exactly where she was from, but um, she was, do you guys know where she was from? What was her? I think she was um, West ancestry? African. I don't know what country she West was West African. From. And she was just pretty much saying that we pretty much deserve to be killed by cops. Mm -hmm. and that our oppression is fake and, and that really racism isn't real mm -hmm. you know um, mm -hmm. and if we can find that we'll share it in the chat or um on tomorrow's presentation but um that's just an example of how not all scam folks are camp folks and again it's not just it's not just about the diaspora but it's about everyone that comes over and immigrate here and pile onto our oppression it's very or problematic. Even, or even well, if you if you born and raised here and you getting in the way, or you you standing in standing in the way preventing us from trying to get ahead, you're a problem too. Yeah, well, and you're I think Doctor, I think Doctor King had a saying, and I'm going to paraphrase. It's not the bitterness of our sense. enemy. Oh, it's not the bitterness of our enemy. It's the silence of our friends. It's the yep. betrayal of our friends, and I think we feel as though because. We do feel we do belong to the diaspora. Um, I think we feel as though Caribbean and, and African immigrants are those friends that, you know, your silence is more wounding than what these white folks going to do to us because we don't expect nothing less or nothing different. Yep. But at two, yeah. Brutus, at two, that's where we're coming from. Yeah, definitely. That's the best summary. You know, yeah. and that brings us to why we need America to redefine what it is to be an ethnicity. Um, the federal definition should be more inclusive than exclusive. Again, the federal definition is either you're Hispanic or you're not. And we argue that ethnicity should be defined by four shared elements, race, nationality, lineage, and culture. And combined, these four elements create a unique identity for persons belonging to a specific group that shares biology, nationality, heritage, and cultural experiences, such as language. And what race comes down to, again, race was not invented to be, to be based on biological or scientific truth. Right. But what it has evolved into, especially with the federal definition of race, um, the black race, is that it's anyone coming from Africa, and specifically from a black racial group in Africa, that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's, it's about if we originate, if black people are black because we originate, our, we come from the original people of Africa, then the question becomes, which continent original people does a person originate from? If you're from Europe, if you originate from Europe as an Irish, a French, an English, a Spanish, a Spaniard, um, a French person, then you're white. If you originate from Africa as an Ethiopian, uh, from Ghana, from um, anywhere, from, you are considered black. Nigeria, Kenya, it doesn't matter. You're black. So what the definition of race has evolved to is 
what continent did, of a, what original people do you belong to? And so that's why I say for the sake of this conversation, we're looking at it from a biological standpoint. Even though it was invented um, in America to be something different, what it has evolved to is what continent do you originate from? And again, if it's for, if, if black people have to be defined as being black because we originate from the continent of Africa, white people are defined as originating from the continent of Europe and so on and so forth. And with nationality, which is the second element, our race is black, the second element is nationality, um, which comes down to what is the person's country of birth, family origin, or citizenship. And there are 195 nations. Here in North America, there's two. And our nationality, we come from the United States of America. So our nationality is America. So we have the first element, which is Black, our race. The second element, our nationality, which is America. Brings us to the third element, lineage. What's the person's ancestral relationship to the United States of America? Did they originate from natives of this land? Were they enslaved or shadowed? Did they come from colonizers or settlers? Or did they people immigrate here? We, our lineage, are from the enslaved, from the shadow, from the institution of America's institution of slavery. So our lineage is descendants of slavery. So we have race, black, nationality, American, and our lineage is descendants of slavery. The fourth element is our cultural element, which is language. As you see, language is a system of written and written and or spoken communication. There are over 6,500 languages. So America defined its only ethnicity based off of the language, which is Spanish. So if America is going to base ethnicity off of language, then it should have 60, over 6,500 ethnicities, but it doesn't. It has one specific ethnicity that it defines, which is Hispanic, which means that you're originating from an Spanish speaking country which means that America defines ethnicity based on language. And it's ironic, as we point out, that the one language that they choose to focus on or to recognize is the language that gave us the term Negro, nigger. Of all the languages, of all the 6,500 languages that they could have chosen to make an ethnicity, they chose the language to make an ethnicity, the one that gave us the most hateful and racial term that they even that, that they have even prescribed as the N word, um, to where it's a word that people are not supposed to say, but yet the one language that you recognize as ethnicity is the very language that gave us that term. So we're bringing all four of the elements together, you get our ethnicity as American descendants of slavery, ADOS. Our first element is our race, we're black. The second element is our nationality, American. The third element is our lineage, we're descendants of slavery. And the fourth element is our shared cultural element, which is language, English. So when bringing all four of those elements together, you get American descendants of slavery. Um, did you guys have anything that you wanted to add to that? I think it's awesome the way that you broke that down and explained it. I love it. Yeah, I think you're a genius that you came up with this in the first place is amazing. Yeah. Well again, it took a, it took all of our research to really bring to really break down all the BS, you know, to where we had to understand through our research that we were being bamboozled into believing that ethnicity was the Webster definition, when in reality is the legality of the definition that we need to worry about. And we're excluded because either you're Hispanic or you're not. And that shouldn't be 
the end all be all of America's definition, you know, of ethnicity. Um, as noted throughout history, the U.S. has forced labels on ADOS and our ancestors. These label, th this labeling has been quite detrimental to us while benefiting the system that oppresses us. There are several things that must happen in order for ADOS to have our own designation. The federal def uh, definition of ethnicity will have to be redefined to be more inclusive to people of non-Spanish origin. ADOS must be assertive in our advocacy for our own ethnic uh, de designation absolutely allowing no, no, no outside influences. The census is at the heart of discussing an ADOS designation. So we must all complete the 2020 census, selecting Black slash African American and writing in American descendants of slavery, ADOS. This will ensure we are counted accurately, just as Black groups within the diaspora. We must follow up with the census by contacting our elected federal, state, and local representatives to let them know how important having a designation is to, to us, our family, and our community. Having a specific designation to ADOS benefits not only ADOS, but benefits America as a whole in addressing its original sin of slavery and the occurred disadvantages that grew from it. Which brings um, us to, oh, what were you gonna say, Trish or Shelly? <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, oh, Shelly. I don't know if you mentioned it, but one of the 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 people it, it benefits the most are are our people that come after us. They oh, yeah. they they need this. Like they they really need this. Yeah, this isn't really for us. I already typed in the chat that. Um, if you've already done the 2020 census, that's fine. Um, reach out to your friends and family and make sure everybody is filling it out because we need to be counted. And if you haven't filled it out, go ahead and check um, Black or African American and write in American descendant of slavery in the, in the, on the line. And then um, start pushing your elected officials um, for our own designation for the 2030 census because this helps our progeny never have to do this go through this like they can we can start being vigilant and and making sure that they don't have to do what we're doing now we're just laying the groundwork for them yeah and that's very crucial that it really is about saving our future generations you know which is one of the key things when you look at it, um, the generations that came before us did. Um, one of the key things that my mom would always um, remind us of, all of her kids, um, that she would say that you were loved before you had a name. She would always tell us that, you know, and as we grew, I, I understood even more what that meant, that we were loved before we even had a name, that our our ancestors and our our family members were fighting for us and laying the groundwork for us to mm -hmm. where that there were certain things that they didn't want us to have to rehash unfortunately because a lot of powers to be were against them as we saw with the black power movement certain moves that they were making and then how they were countered by the NAACP and the African American movement um kind of dilute their efforts where we still have to be able to recognize that we have a responsibility as well to lay that groundwork and to make mm -hmm. sure that the future generations understand that they were loved by us before they even had a name, mm -hmm. you know? And that's one of the most important things that if they could take that away from our generation's work, that our efforts were meant, as you said, for them not to have to go through all of this, is what we're having to go through. And I think about also too for growing up in church, I think it's a scripture 
that says something about leaving something for your children's children, something like a good man, leave something for their children's children and things of that nature. And I think you can apply that even with the, with doing the, with the, with the political education and training our kids in that way and getting them to do the same thing. And I think this time right now is a reminder how important it is, how bad it is, and we need all hands on deck to be able to help us. Because it seems as if we kind of grew into this, this very individualistic type of mindset, like, okay, it's just about me, it's just about my bag, and me and my family. And knowing that if you are moving ahead, just you and your family, yeah, that's great. And that is your responsibility as well. But also to know that you also have a responsibility towards the collective. So, because somebody did it for you. So you don't yeah. get the, you don't get the option to say, that's not really my thing. Like politics isn't really my thing or community work really isn't my thing and stuff like that. We don't really have an option. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that you really hit hit the nail on the head when it came to that. You know, um, but why is the census important? You know, um, and bringing all of that, what we were just discussing, um, back to the census, is that responding to the census is not only our civic duty. It is also, it also affects the amount of funding our community receives, how our community plans for the future, and how representation in government, in our representation in government. Specifically, the data from the 2020 census will be used to ensure public services and funding for schools, hospitals, and fire departments. Plan um, new homes and businesses and improve our communities overall. And it determines how many seats our state is allocated in the House of Representatives. It, it, it's about dollars allocated to each community. Each state receives billions in annual census funds, which amounts to $1.5 trillion for the 2020 census. The census is not just about money, it's about power. So as we mentioned earlier, we understand, we can acknowledge and understand why we don't as a tribe trust the government or trust giving our information. Um, but when it comes to the 2020 census, it is very important that we don't get scared out of our power or we're not shamed out of our power. We have to be able to grab it and own it and use it to our benefit because other people have used our power to their benefit for far too long. Having a specific ethnicity designation. I'm sorry, were you going to say something, Shelly? Yeah, just go, you can go ahead, sorry. Okay. Uh, having a specific ethnicity designation aids in development of methods for improving and expanding the collection, analysis, and publication of data relating to Black American descendants of slavery. It aids in collecting and regularly published statistics which indicate the social and economic condition of Black American descendants of slavery. It aids in the data collection activities to ensure the needs and concerns of the Black American descendants of slavery population are given full recognition through the use of data collection, analysis, publication, and other such methods as deemed appropriate. In the implication, I mean, it also aids in the impl implement of affirmative action programs within the Census Bureau for the employment of personal of personnel of Black American descendants of slavery, which means that we'll be able to have specific a specific affirmative action program within the census that will be um, tasked with focusing on our accurate data collection which has never happened and which we don't have. And because the, um, because Hispanics have an ethnicity designation and have the only ethnicity designation, they are the only group in America that are afforded the opportunity um, or afforded the privilege of having a pro, uh, affirmative action program 
within the census dedicated to just them and making sure that their information is accurate and that their methods are um, valid in collecting and analyzing and pub um, publishing their data. And for us to get there, we have to have we have to have our own designation. Otherwise, it can never happen. So I wanted to say something and it probably, hold on one second. I think it probably also ties into the last slide is that how all of these so-called marginalized groups get lumped together. And so you have it where we're like actually where our suffering is, 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 is what, it, what it is and what it has been. And you can have a person that just happens to not be, say, a white man, who just by their mere race or ethnic background, they're just considered um, marginalized, not considering their income or anything like that. And so when you think about how, when you stated that the census is about power, and you have a particular organization that is giving money for for the African, the, the, the ADOS community, or the African American community, and you are, and, and then they mix like all the people of color up, or all of the other the people that are quote unquote poor, and people are able to kind of hide behind their labels and and attach on to the suffering of other people without considering in full context what their personal experiences are. I hope that makes some sense. What I just expressed. No, it does. It does. Mhm. Mm it does it brings it home it's kind of like okay this particular community the black community the uh, the native black community is is oppressed but because say i am a i don't know i am i am a black Im I, i'm a black immigrant or i'm an immigrant from somewhere i'm also oppressed too but that may not be necessarily that may not be necessarily true you know what i mean yeah yep and and that goes to the whole black and brown coalition that where you have the quote unquote hispanic group that is saying that they're brown people and that they're they're they have a coalition with ados because they share our struggle when in reality that the hispanic ethnicity includes you know, descendants of enslavers, just like American, America includes descendants of enslavers, but the distinction has to be the descendants of slaves. Who are your descendants of the enslaved from Latin America? They have a shared experience with us in the sense that they were enslaved by, you know, a group of people, but even in saying that, specific to America, Eddie right, West, America. Yeah. Yep. When it comes to America, no one shares our experience. You know what I'm saying? People, yeah. everyone has been able to benefit. They have all of them have a shared experience. Um, immigrants and white Americans, because they've all been able to share and benefiting from slavery, mm -hmm. where we've had to wear the cost. But when it comes to wearing the cost of slavery, it's unique to us. And then I go ahead, Trish. Sorry. I just wanted to point out that they may have experienced some elements of um, discrimination um, because of the racist policies in America, unspoken. But what they did not experience was chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. And the in pending, in pending legacy of that that has amounted to our continued genocide and that, has, that America has perfected. Exactly. This is genocide. And they get to leave if they so choose. And they are always promoted to white. Yep. And even when you have Black immigrants that come in and say, I'm not Black. You know, um, it's understandable that they they say 
they say to themselves and their argument is, well, we're not black because we're not your type of black. You know, and it's like, okay, it, that is understandable and that is okay. You are your black. As again, the reaction to the 2020 census showed us that we understand that people want to um, isolate themselves from us, black Americans. But as a black American, we are forced to be whatever label has been forced upon us, whether it's been from the, the system of slavery, whether it's been from those of us, those ADOS that have aided white supremacy and forcing labels upon us to aid white supremacy and to try to promote us as a docile people, you know, um, with them combating the whole Black Pride movement, whatever it is, is that at the end of the day, when it comes to us core ADOS or the ADOS masses, we aren't runners. We have no choice but to be in the struggle and to be in this fight because Mm-hmm. By being, this fight is about survival for us. You know what I'm saying? And the day that we give up fighting against our oppression is the day that we literally have just submitted to our destruction. Okay. And, also, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to say one thing when you were touching on how we're not runners, and even when our people have gone from the South to the North and with the great migration, a lot of those people were met with, especially I know in the, in the Midwest with, I I know one of, I have a good friend of mine. She has, I think her family is in Michigan. They came from Louisiana and how her grandparents left the South was running from racial Tara and literally was met with within a, maybe a five to 10 year period. They moved into this really nice neighborhood for people who was moving from the South to the North. And it was a nice neighborhood and good people and everybody kind of knew each other type of thing. And about five, within five to 10 years of them moving there, they ended up building a plant not very far from there where it was poisoning all of the Adolf people that was there where so many people have died. So yeah. in, even when we've tried to seek refuge into different places where we've been killed, still poisoned and things of that nature. So we've had no, we've literally had nowhere to run. We ain't been able to change our accent to try to morph into something else and to be able to survive or, or, or something like that or or be able to say, okay, or we're not this, or jump in and out of blackness, you know, and things of that nature. We ain't been able to do that. I know I have yeah. been. Yeah. Have not been and, and where others have found refuge in America, we have never been able to find refuge in America. hmm You know? And and that's very telling because and and, and again, not to go into other topics outside of what we're discussing, but Katrina is a is a great example where we uh-huh. became a lot of us became refuge refugees and migrants throughout that yeah. time. But in our country. still yes, within our country and it was because we were still under the same system of oppression, our refuge was not refuge. You know, it was just a, it was just displaced or reorganized oppression you know, um, in a different zip code. You know, our, our oppression just follows us from zip code to zip code, and we can't escape it. Yeah. You know, and that's what, and that's one of the things that make America's genocide so perfect. They perfected our genocide. Um, it has come, it has, it has cost us greatly not having an ethnic, ethnic, designation and one of the greatest costs has been our disenfranchisement we have been disenfranchised because we haven't had we haven't been able to self-identify or haven't had the right to self-identify 
We've never been treated as full citizens in this nation. Our country created a caste system for us to remain a bottom caste that was never meant to prosper. Being dis disenfranchised has meant being stripped of our identity as our ancestors were reduced to being property. The erasure of our lineage, history, and legacy has been due to our disenfranchisement. And because we've been disenfranchised, um, we've been allocated to being the bottom, a bottom caste, which has made us a so social pariahs. And being disenfranchised has meant being robbed of generational wealth. And Yvette Carnell and Antonio Moore says it best, that ADOS are a contagion to wealth. We've been completely locked out of the wealth that we built. And when you understand that we are second class citizens in the nation, in the, in the country that we built, it's an undeniable justice claim that we have on America and why reparations for us is just so important. Not just important, but where it's, it, it literally is our path to our righteous liberation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And because the reason why reparations is such a touchy issue for America is because they un America understands that reparations forces them to confront the deliberate design that they've created to create us to, to cause us to be a permanent underclass. And by recognizing that recognizing our justice claim means that they have to recognize the crimes that they've done to us and they continue to do, you know, and reparations is a threat to their perfect genocide. The lack of, of designation has made it impossible to fully understand the consequences of the legacy of slavery. We need accurate data that reflects our exact population count our collective condition and to combat the rapid the weaponization of the model minority myth and i and one of you guys brought that up earlier about how the model minority myth has been used against us time and time again yeah it's um i kind of see it as it's to hide it, it's basically to it's basically to hide the sins of this nation it's kind of like, okay, it's like America keeps piling on crap on top of crap on top of crap. And it's like, okay, instead of just dealing with what they've done, it's like, no, time has passed. Let's not bring it up. Let's bring in some new faces. Everything is going to be fantastic. And then no one will be able to prove that this is what's really going on here. And you will hear people using some conservative talking points and saying things like oh if this particular group is able to do this then why aren't you all able to do this oh mm -hmm. you're you know you're black too so obviously uh america is not racist because this one person did it or these 10 people did it and so it's kind of like every every when it gets closer to more exposure of their sin it's like let's do something different and flip the script so that we can hide our hands again so and it just it seems like it happens every every decade or so or something like that so yeah yep and and because america has perfected its genocide against us they one of the one of the characteristics of the genocide has been that oh we didn't know that we were being awful to you guys at the time but we realized it two or three decades later that we were just shitty to you guys and it's like in reality, because they do, because America does have a perfect system of oppression, uh, of black oppression or ADOS oppression, where in real time they understand exactly what it is that they're doing, what America's doing to systematically lock us out. And when you have people that are aiding, whether it's immigrants that are coming over and that are aiding, in ADOS oppression because it's sort of looked at as, well, as long as we're not the floor of America, we're good. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of immigrants are the floor of the countries that they migrate from. So when they come to America, as long as they're not the bottom class cast of America, they're good. 
or where where whether it's our own ADOS um family that's aiding in our depression. And again, our ancestors maybe didn't define them as gatekeepers. They knew them as the driver class, you know, throughout slavery. That okay, we're of the same lineage, we're of the same ethnicity, the same tribe, but the driver class aided white supremacy and our oppression. And so whether it's our fellow um, ADOS or whether it's immigrants that are coming over and that are aiding because as long as we're not the bottom class, we're good, or whether it's just simply just white dominance, you know what I'm saying? Like white privilege that is showing itself. Um, as long as they're able to collectively gather around oppressing us, they're good and we feel the need constantly to fight against that and we have to not only fight against white supremacy but we have to fight against the accusations that we're being anti-black because we're calling out the driver slash gatekeeper class or we're calling out our brothers and sisters of the diaspora that are immigrating here and that are aiding in our oppression you know what I'm saying? Where it becomes about us and what we're doing and how that scene is being hateful versus people telling the truth about how our fellow ADOS, some of our fellow ADOS and some of our fellow brothers and sisters in the diaspora are actually aiding in our oppression in America. And that's problematic. But it becomes a problem because we're willing to call it out. So I think that when it comes to the system of white supremacy, when it comes to them admitting their faults 30, 40, 50 years later, I think that that's also in their plan. Um, they know yep. what they are doing in the moment. They know <laughs> that they're going to apologize 40 to 50 years later. When you, take a, when you think about our Black men and you, you go, our black boys, and you go falsely accuse them of something and lock them away for 50 years, well, you just robbed their whole damn life. And so, mm -hmm. like, they're 50, 60 years old now, and they've been, in, they've been in prison all their lives for something that they never did, or for something that was, something that was a petty crime. Yep. And so, so it's like, at this moment, it's like their whole response, their, their whole point is to to rob our families to separate our families to lock our men in cages and to and and, and go and say okay oh and, and then try to lift us up at the same time and say okay oh they come from those single parent households oh and those black women they're so fantastic no you you've yep. been separating our family for centuries so mm -hmm. negative i do not like that at all yep and and then undocumenting our existence mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying um when it comes to humanizing us and all of this just comes back full circle about not only where we came from but where we are now and where a person has to understand that at the core of that is us not having our identity is us not having our own designation is that by not having our own designation it takes away from us being able to have to tell our story. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know what I'm saying? Our history and our legacy has been erased throughout all of this because it's just, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just something able to be erased or just something that's able to be, to happen because it's just our experience. And, it's, mm -hmm. and the more that American and people that are joining America's efforts to oppress us, as long as they're able to write the narrative as we're the problem and that we we're creating we're creating we're we're the cause of our of us being at the bottom instead of recognizing that all of this is deliberate because mm -hmm. we're not able to self identify mm -hmm. it's able to be perfected it's able to continue and we're able to be disenfranchised and we're able and America's able to get away with having us as a permanent bottom class. And also, too, since we're on topic with that, is that since the whole system seeks to divide and conquer every in every place that it can, and just touching back on to splitting up our families, I think that women and men 
ADOS men and women have to recognize that when you do something to our men, our men, you do something to our whole family. When you do yep. something to the women, you do something to our whole families. So when you you kill you kill our men and boys in the street, that affects us too. So I've heard some people make reference and they'll say, "Oh, they do our men so wrong." No, they do. They're doing our families wrong. Yep. <laughs> they're trying yep. to kill our families. That's they're trying to destroy our families over and over again. Every generation. That's what they're trying to do. Well, that's what they've yeah. been doing. Yeah. So pretty much what what we're bringing all of this to is how all of this is important and why we need an ethnicity is that America has used our identity or forced identities on us to aid in our oppression, to aid in our genocide. And until we get our own specific designation until we're able to self-identify as ADOS, they're going to be able to continue our genocide. And one of the reasons why we need our own designation is to stop the theft of resources that are supposed to be allocated to our community, that are supposed to be for us, that are being able to be distributed out to everybody else under the umbrella of people of color or yeah. um, um, the, what is it, um, a, a tide lifts all boats type of thing or universal policies that yeah. where we have to have our own designation to tell our own story to show that the harm done to us is unique and the repair must be unique as well. Uh-huh. And also, I think that can work for other. I think it could work for other communities. The the quote unquote other people who want to identify as people of color, that mm-hmm. maybe can work for them because their their experiences are similar. But because our our experience is so distinct and nobody else has suffered like we have, that is why our that's another reason why we have to be distinctive and separate, and so and seen that way, according yeah. you know by law. So yeah. Nope, it makes sense. It makes sense. And the only way for that to happen for us to move forward is for ADOS to officially advocate for the right to self-identify. We have to advocate for ourselves. We have to put Black politics or ADOS politics um, as a priority because without Black politics, we can't have Black business. We can't have Black collective empowerment. Um, and a lot of people would like to detach the two, but, and they love to use Black Wall Street as an example, but Mm -hmm. without Black Wall Street being able to have its own independent wealth or its own independent, um, track of self, the U.S. government, yes, the U.S. government was able to do whatever it wanted and to bomb our community. You know what I'm saying? because its power is always going to be mightier than ours because the the system has been designed for that purpose. So don't matter how much we try to carve out for ourselves, um, the system has been designed to destroy us. And that's not a reflection on our inability or our will to do for self. It's a reflection of America's deliberate design to destroy us. And that is what the conversation must be about or must be centered around. And that's not something that we have to be ashamed about. Being a victim of a deliberate system, being a victim of a perfected genocide, being a victim of the legacy of slavery is not something to be ashamed of. It's something that we have to acknowledge and be aware of to move forward. You know, and hurt feelings aside, Hurt feelings are never an excuse to push away truth. Right. You know, um, so as we wrap this up, you know, um, and I know that we gave you guys a lot, a lot of information tonight. Um, we really would like everyone to join us tomorrow where we dive deeper into this conversation, but not too, too deep, but enough to where we can push the conversation to where do we go from here? Amen.
Uh, and I want to I want to thank you, um, all three of you, for working on this. I know a lot of work went into it, um, and in this presentation, well done. But it does not nearly reflect all of the research and the time and the effort and energy that went into our effort as the Southern Collaborative of ADOS Dallas, ADOS Orlando in AOS Atlanta. So my head's off to you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I hope everyone joins us for the second part where we will discuss policy and um, where do we go from here and, and giving you a, foot, uh, a blueprint to advocate for our own ethnic designation. Yes, and there'll be group participation tomorrow and we'll have an interactive game that Trish can tell you more about in Franco's presentation. Yeah, so if you were at the um, Sunday cookout, then you got to play Kahoot with um, Princess Six. So if you, if you didn't get to play, you can go ahead and um, download the app. It's Kahoot. K-A-H-O-O-T. I also put it in the chat. If you just um, use it online, which is how I do it, it's kahoot.it. Kahoot.it, but we'll go over that tomorrow. And I also put in the chat the link for um, tomorrow's presentation, uh, a link to help you find your state representatives, and a link for the census. Also, the LA Times article for Philip T. Gay is in the chat. That's all I got. Some good stuff. Hi. All right, any final words, guys? No, just come back tomorrow. That's all I have. <laughs> come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Bring your notepads right. bring it, and you bring your drink. And thank y'all so much for joining in with us today. Yep. Yes, bring your libation, as Breaking Brown would say. <laughs> Let's see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Right. Bye bye. <laughs>